Hey everyone and welcome back. I want to say a big thank you for all the positive feedback on the previous videos. I've got plenty more ideas in the works for tools that'll make track creation and Assetto Corsa even smoother. I also realized I could share some of the other tools I've made over time to speed up my workflows outside of track modding. That'll be covered in future videos as well. But for now, let's jump into the AC Track Tools add-on and take a look at how it can speed up your workflow when building tracks in Blender. After opening the blend file, you'll see a small scene I've prepared to explain everything step by step. Besides the tools, I also included a couple of assets and materials I've made just to give you a basic starting point. I didn't put too much time into those since I imagine most of you will be using your own assets anyway. The reference terrain I included is just a plane with a few subdivisions and a displace modifier. It's a good starting point for your first experiments with the tools. The road tool uses a curve as its main input. Let's go through all the other inputs to see what kind of control you have. First, you can adjust the number of subdivisions of the input curve. The Z smoothing option comes in handy when working with real world terrain, especially if there are bumps or sudden elevation changes in the data. Next, you can choose which reference terrain the road should follow. I've added a switch here to help with performance since shrink wrapping in real time can get heavy. Then we have controls for shaping the road itself. You can adjust the main road width, the edge width, and the edge height. The width is also multiplied by the curve radius. You can then resample each section of the road to control the topology. Once you've shaped the road, you can assign a material to it. In the shader editor, make sure to use an attribute node set to UV map instead of a texture coordinate node. This step is necessary anytime your input isn't a mesh. There's also a section for the road's border lines. Here you can control the width and assign their material. You can hide different parts of the road as well. This is really useful when you're tracing the road from reference images or when you want to export just the curve data for later use. Finally, the last part of the setup lets you split the mesh into chunks based on the number of points. This is mainly for export purposes. Let's move on to the terrain tool. First, place the plane slightly above the reference terrain. For the tool to work properly, make sure the origin of the plane is set to the geometry. Now, in the modifier settings, assign both the reference terrain and the road object. The geometry section might look a bit overwhelming at first, but once you play around with it, it starts to make sense. You can start by subdividing the entire grid for a base level of detail. Then, the road subdivision adds extra geometry around the road itself. You can control the size of this high detail area using the road subdivision distance slider. Points farther away from the road can be merged by distance or even deleted entirely. To help the terrain blend naturally with the road, it's flattened around the edges. The flatten min value controls how far from the road the slope begins and flatten max sets where that slope ends. Just like with the road tool, you can also split the mesh by point count if you're preparing it for export. The road post group works in two modes. You can either use it on a separate curve or stack it directly on top of the road modifier. If you're stacking it, make sure the middle curve is visible in the road modifier as that's the one the posts are generated from. You can select the object you want to instance as a post and set the spacing between them. There's also a width parameter which helps fine tune the post positions. It's scaled by the curve's radius so that everything stays nicely aligned with the road edges. Finally, there's an option to delete posts that are too close to other objects, which helps prevent overlaps with things like guardrails or signs. Make sure to use this after applying the guardrail group, otherwise you'll run into a dependency cycle error. The guardrails use the side edges of the generated road as input. To set this up, Duplicate the road object and make sure it only has the road modifier applied. Disable everything except the side curves and convert the result to a mesh. After selecting the guardrail group, you'll notice nothing shows up yet. That's because we need to create vertex groups first. These must be named exactly as shown here, so the system knows where to place each element. Once that's done, head back to the modifier tab and make sure all the correct objects are assigned. The road object here is optional. 
I included this input because many times I needed to tweak the road shape after already generating the guardrails. With this option, small changes to the road won't break the alignment. It keeps the rails in place. Now you can start assigning points to each vertex group and placing the rails and arrows. There's also full control over the height, spacing, and position of the guard rails. You can hide or show each part individually and even generate a collider mesh. And just like the other tools, the output can be split by point count for export. The lines are generated from a simple mesh line, which is subdivided using the subdivide input value. You can control the width of the line, the length of the dashed segments, and assign a material. You also pick the object you want the line to shrink wrap onto, usually the road. To define the type of line, you'll need to create vertex groups and assign points to them. Just like with the guardrails, the naming of these groups is important, so make sure they match exactly. For the stripes, all you need is a simple plane in any shape. As with the terrain tool, make sure the origin is roughly at the center of the geometry. It works best when you only use one plane per object. You can adjust the spacing and width of the stripes and also rotate them. Then, just assign a material and pick the object to shrink wrap them onto. The wall blocks group uses a curve placed above the terrain as an input. For the blocks to appear, make sure you assign the terrain in the modifier settings. The height of the wall is controlled by how far each point is from the terrain. You can adjust the slope of the wall by changing the tilt of the curve points and use the radius to scale the wall along the y-axis to better match the terrain. There are also controls to scale the blocks, flip the curve direction, and assign a material. If you want to use a custom object instead of the generated blocks, switch to instance mode and pick the object you want to use. The spacing can then be controlled by the block dimensions values. For the trees, I first duplicate the terrain object and then stack the tree group on top of the terrain group. You can also apply the first group if you no longer need to modify the reference terrain. There are three modes to choose from. Show points displays a point cloud. It's useful for checking distribution, but not for export. For exporting, switch to export points and then convert it to mesh. The third mode lets you instance custom objects from a collection instead of just points. You can assign a road object to automatically mask out trees along the road. If you want to prevent trees from intersecting other objects, just place those objects in a collection and assign it to the delete close to setting. Then you can fine tune the distance from the road, spacing between trees, overall density, or remove trees that are too far away. There's also an option to preview the point count before applying the modifier. When applying the modifiers, there are a few things to keep in mind. Any groups that use a curve as input can't be simply applied in the modifier tab. You'll need to convert them to mesh instead. I usually find it easiest to duplicate the objects as needed, enable only the necessary mesh in the modifier, and then convert everything to mesh step by step. This way, you make sure you're only exporting what you actually need. For the road tool, remember to disable the curves when applying it since they're only needed for other modifiers. That's why it's a good idea to leave the road tool as the last one to apply. The road post group can stay stacked on top of the road modifier while you're working with it. When you want to apply it, just copy the object and disable the mesh output of the road, leaving only the curves visible. These curves are used in the road post group to place the instances, so once that's done, you'll get the final post exactly where you want them. Also, don't forget to delete the post group from the road object before applying it, so it doesn't get duplicated into the road geometry by accident. Blender tends to mess things up when using the make instances real command. It actually applies the node group to every created instance, which results in the posts ending up all over the place. To work around this, I use an empty object. In its object properties, go to instancing and select the road post collection. Make sure the post is positioned at the world origin so everything stays centered. Then in the modifier, replace the original post object with the empty press F3 and find make instances real. This way, everything stays where it should and you get properly instanced object. My tip is to always keep a version of the blend file where all the groups stay unapplied. When exporting, I duplicate the file so I can easily go back and make changes later if needed. It also really helps to name everything clearly in a way that makes sense to you when you revisit the project. 
I hope I managed to explain everything clearly. This is the first version, so more functions and improvements will be added over time. If you have any ideas for features or suggestions, definitely let me know. Even though most of the important info is covered in this video, please also read the product page to make sure you don't miss anything. Before purchasing, keep in mind that some of these tools can get pretty heavy on your machine, especially when working on larger maps. In those cases, it might be a good idea to work in smaller sections. I really hope this tool helps you speed up your workflow and makes map creation even more enjoyable. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.